Today we're going to discuss building a consciousness of grace. Now, of course, as long as we have problems, we are maintaining a barrier between the perfect flow of spiritual presence into our experience. And so in your building of a consciousness of grace, we must rise above every problem that we see, recognizing it for what it is. And if we mistakenly identify that problem, it is going to come at us in a new disguise. All of us have had problems and all of us have made mistakes. But what we have not realized is that every mistake we have made throughout our lives is the same mistake all over again. You have never made two different mistakes, although you think you have. The repetition of the same mistake under a new name and a new location and a new condition always recurs because we have not correctly identified the real problem. Now it may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be financial, it may be something domestic, it may be the relationship of parent and child, it can be many things. But none of these are the problem. These are the effects of the problem. These occur because you have not found your problem. And the reason they recur is because it is necessary for you to find what the problem really is. And so you can go on, as the world has, repairing all your fences today and discovering that your problem now comes at you in another form, under a new name. And then you can take care of it, and lo and behold, in spite of your valiant efforts, here comes a third problem. And always you are running to the dam to put your finger in it, to hold out the water while a new hole is bursting open somewhere along the line. When you have located the source of the problem, and when you have done something about it, then lo and behold, the various assortments of problems that have been besieging you diminish. They all borrow from the truth that lights up the center of your being and flows out, and as the light flows to the problem, the illusion or darkness of problem is dispersed. Now what is that center that we're looking for? It's something so mysterious that perhaps the only way we could ever have understood it is to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What happens when God says to us, I have no pleasure in your dying? What does that really mean to us? Do you suppose that if God has no pleasure in your dying, that you can die? Do you think it's possible for you to do that? Do you think it's possible for anyone to do that if God has no pleasure in our dying? Do you see that was the announcement to the world that there is no such thing as dying? That which is not the will of the Father is not happening. There is no pleasure in God that we die. There is no will in the Father 
that death occur. It simply cannot occur because it is not the will of the Father. But if you trace that which appears to be a death, who is dying? If God is all in all, who is dying? And when you place the body in a tomb, if God has no pleasure in death, how can we pronounce that someone has died there? What are we putting in that tomb? Is there something there in spite of the body that we put in the tomb, something there that does not die? Is it not true then that that which we call the death of a body is not the death of the life of God that is there? And that life, which is invisible, remains to be a living life. But now go back before the so-called body has died. Was not that invisible life there before? Are we not being taught that the invisible life of us is the invisible self of us now, and we don't have to wait until they bury the body to discover that? Is not the missing ingredient in your life your invisible self? Once you find it, you discover the source of your problem. Every problem you have ever encountered from the moment of birth to this second has been the unawareness of your invisible self. And every problem comes to you as evidence of the fact that you have not found your identity in the invisible. You, through a human mind, trying to perpetuate your human identity, living in the confinement of the mind, seeking always to improve the human self, wander off away from your invisible self. And the mind refuses stubbornly to turn around, to turn ye and live, to seek things above, to move out of the belief that this, which walks on two feet, is not the divine creation, is not the divine image, is not the perfection of God incarnate. What is it? It is the mortal dream, the illusion of self, the self beset with problems because it is not the divine self. It is not the enduring self. It is the self that dies. And it dies only because it is not the living self. Now we must find that which is the invisible self of us. And we must learn to live in that self without ceasing. That is the only prayer there is without ceasing, the living in your invisible selfhood. And the reason for it is that the life of God, which is your invisible self, is the only life you can ever live in that goes beyond the grave. The only life you can ever live in that is under the law of God. The only life that is life. And until you are willing to lay down your personal sense of life, your mental concepts about life, Every problem that comes at you is saying, after me there'll be another one.
and still another until something in you surrenders and instead of trying to overcome this problem and that problem and the next problem you realize that there is a law of grace and it does function in the child of God and it does keep that child immune from every known mortal and material problem the human mind wishes to perpetuate its concepts and so it prays it seeks it even boldly says I want to find God you know it really doesn't want to find God at all that's the last thing the human mind wants to find what it wants to find is a pleasant Santa Claus God a God who will say to the human mind now you just go along and I'll take care of things for you and you just let me know what you want and you'll find that I will produce it and I will take care of your family and I will take care of your life and I will make this a better world for you that's what the human mind wants it doesn't want God God is not about to make this a better world for anyone because this world will never be the perfect creation of God and it is the Father's will that we live in his perfection not in our mental concept about it the human mind is going to live within its own restricted limited finite concept about that which it can never know which it can never receive which it can never see the human mind refuses to enter the kingdom of God the human mind says God is not here the human mind says God is tomorrow the human mind says God is up there we have evidence of that human mind in every religion on the earth it has given us a half God and you cannot live with a half God it has given us a tomorrow God and you cannot live with a tomorrow God the human mind says God will do things for us tomorrow that when we can contact God things will happen the human mind says there is no kingdom of God on earth now it simply has no way of knowing there is the human mind does not believe in grace it believes in its own ego it says without me how would I ever get along the human mind is the very antithesis of the grace of the Spirit of God it does not know that its father is the illegitimate cosmic mind it does not know where it came from and where it's going or why and it stumbles ultimately into its own grave taking the body with it we've had the human mind on the seat of every government on the face of the earth and we've had human government the soul faculty says to the human mind be still what do you know about the thoughts of God God's thoughts are not your thoughts God's thoughts are not finite God's thoughts don't begin at birth and end at death God's thoughts know nothing of the problems you have invented and then it says to the human mind don't you know the kingdom of God is on earth as in heaven 
And the human mind says, oh, impossible. Ridiculous. Look around you. It isn't here. And the soul says, but it is. And you will never see it. And as long as you imprison that personal sense of self, it will never see it. And it will receive problem after problem. And you will patch up these problems until you are no longer there to do it. The kingdom of God within you has to be here, not tomorrow. Has to be today, not tomorrow. And that kingdom of God within you is the only place you can ever find God. God is in the kingdom of God within you. And that kingdom of God within you where God is is that which remains when the body is no more. That kingdom remains forever. And when you find that kingdom on this side of the veil instead of the other side, then you have found the Holy Grail. You have found the self. You have found your invisible living selfhood, which is the kingdom of God within you. And you never will find it with your human mind. It will chase around. It will seek up alleyways and corners. It will read books. It will consult authorities. It will stand and look up to heaven and shout and pray and plead. It will go to lectures. It will listen to the scientist and the religious authority. And it will put it all together and be no further ahead than it is or has been since the world began. That mind does not want God. because God means the end of that mind. When the world saw the crucifixion of Jesus and then the resurrection, they thought he had raised his body from the dead. And very advanced students said, watch how he increases the vibrations while he's in the tomb so that the body can disappear. But that isn't what happened. And John had made a fantastic discovery. John had discovered the invisible man. John had discovered the invisible Christ who stood where the world saw what they called Jesus Christ. John didn't tell us that the body now disappeared through somebody raising the vibrations. He had discovered there was no body there. The invisible man who walked the earth was the Christ itself, the invisible selfhood of Jesus, ever present. And you couldn't put it in the tomb. And it raised up another body. But John was telling us that because he had discovered this truth about Jesus Christ, he had discovered a truth about you and me that where we walk, where we appear, our invisible selfhood is. And the human mind will not live in that invisible selfhood. It wants to live in this outer world, which it knows, which it sees, which it touches. That which it cannot see or touch, it does not know exists, and so it does not try to live in its invisible self the kingdom of God within you. And the invisible self that John discovered was the self of Jesus walking the earth are one and the same. There will be no resurrection of your invisible self. Your invisible self will ever be. And when you are in your invisible self in the time that you should be in it, 
which is not tomorrow, but now, then you will understand why we are told now are we the sons of God. Now, where you are, invisible to your human mind and the mind of the world, is your invisible self. Its name is Christ. Its name is life. Its life is without end. Its perfection can never diminish. It is the reality of your being. And only when the mind, which knoweth not the things of God, which builds its Tower of Babel, which lives by observation, when that mind has been rolled away, when you rest in the acceptance Thou seest me, thou seest the Father, thou seest the invisible self of God where I stand. When you have accepted that, when you dwell with that, then you have entered a realm of the unbroken divine consciousness. And I think you may say that this is probably one of the prime secrets we can entertain in our consciousness that the infinite divine self called God is present and conscious. But the threat of continuity from that divine self is not maintained to the human mind. And so we are segmented. We live in a sense of separation from that perfect, present, divine consciousness. Separated from the infinite, we are finitized by the human mind. The branch cut off. But in the absence of the beliefs of that human mind, in the willingness to stand aside from the testimony of the false sense of self, in the acceptance of the invisible self. The willingness to dwell there until this is an experience, until you can say, this is my invisible self. I feel it and know it. I accept it. It is living. It is real. It is the Son of God. It is the kingdom of God within me. And it has the Christ mind. And that mind is attuned with the Father. That mind is in conscious oneness with the divine self. That mind is one with the consciousness of God, and that is the continuity of consciousness. When you have attained that awareness through the invisible self, then you are transformed, for the mind has been renewed. The one infinite flow of power and truth and love and spirit flowing through the new mind, the mind of the invisible self, the Christ mind, pours forth where you stand as the expression of the infinite. And every problem which had besieged the human finite sense of mind now comes up against the one power. And as the darkness disappears in the light, without any resistance, without any effort, without any desire to improve, reform, or correct. The one infinite consciousness functioning through your invisible self realized becomes the law unto you, goes before you, perfects and performs all that concerneth thee. Why? Because there is an unbroken continuity of consciousness the separation is banished. 
There's no longer the infinite mind and your human mind separated from it, trying to live its sense of life. It has yielded to the infinite, but not by going directly to the infinite. It hasn't tried to find God. You cannot find God with a human mind. You must find the Son of God. You must find your infinite, invisible self. When you find your invisible self, you found the Son of God who knows the Father. Then there is an unbroken continuity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. All functioning as your very being, the One, without separation. And there is no place now for another power. There's no power of evil anymore. All these powers which come in the form of problems which we accept and fight and struggle against are all the shadows of the human mind as it rejects the invisible self as it crucifies the invisible Christ. Do you remember that Paul had to be blinded first before he could see? That blinding was the complete obliteration of his human concepts. That's what it symbolized. Everything he knew was obliterated in that blinding. And that powerful human mind, which knew all the answers, no longer was on the seat of the throne. Now there was the Christ mind. There was nobody to persecute for Paul anymore. All he could do now was go out and let that light shine itself. He had to let his invisible self live the visible Paul. When John the Baptist came, he was revered as a great prophet. The Hebrews always looked to their prophets for the interpretation of the laws. And when one could walk out of the world as an ascetic, living the austere life, to that type of mind, it indicated that this was a great prophet. In fact, at the time, John the Baptist was the greatest Hebrew prophet alive. But you see, he had left the world. He had stepped out of it, which is the same as Paul going blind. He had given up his human concepts. He was the greatest Hebrew prophet of the day, and what did he do? He turned around to his own people and said, don't look to me. Do you see there had to be someone there they respected who would turn them to something else? What was he turning them to? Jesus Christ? No, not at all. He was turning them to their invisible self, which they could not understand. But they could understand a visible Jesus Christ. And so that's how we are taught by degrees. That visible Jesus Christ was the invisible Christ of every man who walks this earth, the light that shined in the darkness. That invisible Christ walking there with the name Jesus is the same invisible man who sits where you are. His name isn't Jesus. His name is the light of your being, the infinite invisible spirit, your invisible self. John the Baptist was pointing the spotlight at the invisible self of every man who walks the earth. 
And that's why he was a voice crying in the wilderness. And so at the banks of the Jordan, the world thinks that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. When you meditate on this, you will learn that it was Jesus who was invisibly baptizing John the Baptist. The invisible baptism was taking place there in which the Spirit anoints the inner self and we are opened up to the truth of being. The awareness of your invisible self is your inner baptism. When you are aware that though you see me as mortal being, though the world sees you as mortal being, the invisible self of you is the very perfect eternal light of God. And as you rest in that and are willing to live with that understanding until it takes root, until it lights your consciousness, until it supersedes the finite levels of the human mind. If you will do this without ceasing, building that unbroken consciousness of the infinite, just by knowing your inner self as present, you will discover that John the Baptist in you is dying and Christ in you is rising and they will meet at the banks of the Jordan in your consciousness and each will bless the other and there will be an invisible dove you will discover you are being united into the one self as the mental sense of self passes by and the soul sense of self rises, each blesses the other and takes its rightful place in your consciousness. The banks of the Jordan are in your consciousness. The John the Baptist in you must come to the invisible Christ to be baptized. That means the mind must submit to the soul. The invisible self must be accepted. It isn't enough to walk the hills in a flowing white robe or to live on nuts and honey. It isn't enough to speak of God. One must accept the kingdom of God within as the invisible self. And the law of that kingdom is perfection. John was still living in the belief that a Messiah might come. John was still living in the belief that there were powers beside the power of God. John was still living in the belief that there were things to overcome in this world. He was not the finished consciousness of the divine self. And even if you today were in that mentality which was revered by men, even if you today were a great inventor or a great discoverer or surpassed in many fields or many categories of human talent, you would still be John the Baptist awaiting the inner Christ for the soul faculties to be released that you may find your invisible life. That invisible life and God are one and the same. 
where that invisible life is, God is. And that isn't tomorrow. If we live to be another million years old, God will be no different then than this instant. The life of God right here and right now is exactly what it ever has been and will be. The mortal mind wants to put that off. It wants God, but not this instant. It would prefer to have God tomorrow. And you cannot. The moment you want God tomorrow and not this instant, you are denying your invisible self. And that means you're living in a shadow of yourself. A second self. A self that never can be, but only seem to be. The only self of you is that invisible self, which is the light of God. And that self, is now perfect as your father, is now the fullness of God. Nothing is withheld from your present invisible self, nothing. And if you have a problem, your problem is that you have not accepted your present perfect invisible self. And you are clinging to a sense of you which is not you. The problem is in the false sense of you. That's the problem. And that false sense of you will have another problem and still a third and a fourth. But the perfect, present, invisible self of you has no problem. Now, here, this moment and forever. And that is why John the Baptist says, I am not worthy to even open his shoe latchet because John the Baptist represents the human mind. The human mind cannot serve the spirit. The human mind must abdicate. It cannot even open the shoe latchet of spirit. In other words, you cannot mix spirit and matter. You cannot mix spirit and mind. When you accept the invisible self of you as yourself, you are pronouncing yourself to be the spirit of God without a second self. The spirit of God is not going to be buried. The Spirit of God does not have a human mind. The Spirit of God does not have human aspirations. And so you cannot accept your spiritual self, your invisible self, by writing it on the blackboard a hundred times. You can only accept it by knowing its presence and giving yourself to it, letting it live itself, letting it direct what you have called your human mind, letting it direct your physical activities, letting your human selfhood be a tool in the hands of your invisible self. There is a capitulation, but not until you can say, the invisible self that I am, this Spirit of God, this Christ is the living word, the one. That I am, I am. And no other. I am not a second self walking in human footsteps. I'm not a mortal being subject to problems. I am divorced from that human self however it may appear to others. I am living in cause, in the invisible. And that which shows forth in the visible as effect 
must conform to the law of divinity if I live in the divine kingdom on earth as the invisible child of God. Grace can only function in the Christ mind and the Christ body. And it does appear to human beings out here as the perfection and harmony of a physical body, which it never is. That is the appearance. And that is also the disappearance of what we term mortal problems. Grace is your invisible self lived in, accepted, showing itself forth as the harmony of your being. And then we are completely devoid of any interest in what the physical self is going to do. That is not where our consciousness lies. It is not in what will the physical self do today or tomorrow or how. Our consciousness without ceasing lies in knowing that I am an invisible being made of invisible spirit living in an invisible kingdom, here and now. And without ceasing, there is where my consciousness abides, and that is the sowing to the Spirit, the acceptance that Christ is living its life now as my being. And all that denies this has established a beachhead in me only as a false sense of self which I need never accept. Those myriad problems attacking that false sense of self are gone like that because that false sense of self is all that keeps those problems alive. One problem. Me. No other problem the me that never could be, the me that worships the God of death instead of the God of life, the me that worships the half God, the tomorrow God, the somewhere else God, the me that refuses to be life, to be I, the living spirit, to be the one who is ordained of the Father, maintained by the Father in an unbroken consciousness so that the living word of the Father becomes the living word of the Son, becomes the outer activity which we call the human being. When we see you and you have seen the Father then we shall see the Father functioning as you. And then John the Baptist will have died and been beheaded. And Christ in you will have risen. And there will be no resurrection. There won't be anybody in a tomb that has to increase its vibrations. There simply will be life eternal where you are. Never in need of being resurrected, only to be recognized and lived in. Now let's look at our problems. What are they? What are your problems? Every problem is a denial of your identity, isn't it? Every single problem is a denial of your identity. And so your center and your circumference are one and the same. Your center is Christ, your allness is Christ, and Christ is everywhere. Christ is the one infinite body of the Father. 
Christ is the infinite mind of the Father. Touch Christ where you are, you have touched the universal. Live in the body of Christ where you are, and you live in the universal. Why are we to learn this? For the very simple reason that when they bury the body, that invisible self of us will be our living self. Consciously. Consciously. Let anything happen to this earth when you are consciously that invisible self you will discover the power of that self is truly omnipotent. It knows no second power in the world. It knows nothing about nuclear radiation. It knows nothing about nuclear fallout. It knows nothing about diseases. It knows nothing about floods, fires, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Why? Because the Christ mind only knows reality, only experiences reality. It doesn't live in the dream of matter. It doesn't live in the personal sense of self. Now, if you were in a dream at the moment, if you actually were dreaming, if you were asleep and dreaming, in that dream, the things you would know, people you would know, would be very real. And there's nothing in this room that would exist for you. Nothing. You'd be in the dream. So this room wouldn't be real, the people here wouldn't be real, what we are doing wouldn't be real, only your dream would be real. And so for you in the dream, this room would be invisible. It wouldn't be visible to anyone in your dream until they awakened, and then there wouldn't be a they, they would be gone, and you would become aware of this room. It would no longer be invisible to you. But in your dream, this room would be invisible, and only your dream would be visible. So it is with Christ. In the human dream, only the human world is visible. And we say that God is invisible. Christ is invisible. The kingdom is invisible. But it's only invisible to those in the dream. <coughs> And that which is in the dream, which is called the world, is real to those in the dream. But awake thou that sleepest from the dream, and then that which was invisible becomes visible. And that which was visible becomes invisible. It is reversed. The moment you awaken in Christ, all of the invisibility that has been called the infinite invisible is no longer invisible. It is very visible to Christ. And because it is reality, because it is invisible to the mortal dreamer, we are told that we are blind. We have eyes, but we cannot see. Now, we are going to live in this invisible we are going to be lifted out of the visible sense of life to a degree that we can know that the invisible is a reality. That in it there is a divine law of perfection. And that there is no limitation. That there is no finite time or space. That there is no place in the invisible where there is a problem, that nothing can ever go astray in the invisible kingdom of God. Every time you have a problem, it is telling you that you're not in the kingdom of God. There are no problems in the kingdom of God. Now that's the missing ingredient, your invisible self.
When John wrote his gospel, he had discovered the missing ingredient which enabled Jesus Christ to appear to perform miracles, to tame all of nature, to reverse all material law, to move through all of the conditions that beset other human beings and yet be unaffected by them. He had discovered the invisible Christ. Before Jesus Christ, John had to point to Jesus Christ as the one who would demonstrate the invisible Christ. And after Jesus Christ, John, another John, had to point back to Jesus Christ to show who had demonstrated the invisible Christ. On each side of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist and John the Beloved Divine. Each pointing to the one between them, saying, he's the one. He's demonstrating the invisible nature of your life. We had to have them both. And we even had to have disciples walk with him so he could demonstrate through and to them the invisible nature of their life. And even now, it just seems like a beginning to come to that awareness that the invisible nature of the life he demonstrated, which is perfect and without problems, is your life and mine. And it is a now life a here life, a life that says, come unto me. I will give thee rest, meaning peace. I will take thee into that which is called the seventh heaven of rest, of peace, of reality. You must dwell deep within shedding off these onion skins of mortality until you feel that invisible self. That is you. And that you is immaculate now. The invisible you will remain ever elusive unless you consciously look for it instead of God in the heaven, instead of God around the corner, instead of God in a book, instead of God in your mouth. The invisible self of you and God are one and the same. I and the Father, I, the invisible self of you and the Father, are one. And when you find I, the invisible self of you, right where you are. You are in the kingdom of God and don't leave it. Don't go out again. Move there, live there, know you are there. And know that no problem can enter there and therefore every problem is only an attempt at trying to get you out of yourself. You need not go out. Stand ye fast in your self. No matter what the appearance, stand in your invisible self and watch how beautifully grace dispels the illusion of a problem that only exists for the false second sense of self. This builds your consciousness of grace. That's a broad outline. We'll fill in the details after meditation. <laughs>